In a world where zombies, ghosts, serial killers, and vampires all exist, it's Nico, Brian, Mike, and Dustin, and they are all that stand between you and the films that could end the world. Welcome to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Review Podcast. We just want to thank all our fans and listeners. We really appreciate the support. And before we get into tonight's film review, I just want to give a quick shout out to our website, don'tgooutthere.com. We have all of our episodes, interviews, uh, celebrity shout outs in our online store and our blog. Just go check that out. And a quick shout out to our social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search our name, Don't Go Out There, and you'll find us. You'll see Brian's awesome uh, artwork he's done for us. And if you have an iPhone, iPad, anything like that, give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Where we've got over 120 now, and we're reaching all these new people, and it's awesome. Uh, tonight is my film review. We're going to jump right into it. I picked 2009's Orphan, and I'm really excited to talk about this movie. It's a... Uh, it's an interesting flick, and I really enjoy it. I always have. It's got one of my favorites in the horror genre, period, uh, Vera Farmiga. And the acting in this movie is great. I think the tw- the plot twist at the end, I don't think it's great, but I think it's good. And and, and just an incredible acting job by the main, the main star of the film, the little girl, Isabel Furman. She's incredible. I think the acting is great top to bottom, honestly. Uh Brian, you want to go next? General overview. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree with you about that. The acting for sure. Um, I've actually never seen this movie until this week, actually. And uh, I mean, I'm going to be honest. It was just okay for me. Um, I've kind of racked my brain for a week to figure out, you know, exactly the reason why I don't love this film because you know it has super high production quality, and I don't even know if I can really express the why very well even now. I mean, it's one of those that just didn't rub me the right way. I mean, with that said, you know, object, objectively speaking, you know, Vera was my bright spot for this film for sure. And Isabel Furman gave a great performance as well. The writing is good. The dialogue is good. Like we said, um, there's just a lot that didn't resonate with me, like personally. And, you know, some that honestly resonated with me too personally. So it's almost like a tale of two films with me. It's just, it's going to be a really weird review for me, I think. So, so buckle up, let's get weird. (laughs) <laughs> go ahead mike general overview brother yeah so i've seen this movie a few times now and i gotta be honest man i i i really love this movie i think it's awesome um i think it it's a little long but i don't think it hurts it that it is long i, I think that's a, just a common complaint i have with movies in general that i feel or just l- let's cut this down some but i don't think that hurts this movie at all i think the acting is great I love the way this movie is directed from a from just a camera standpoint, a movie maker standpoint, the way they use the, the lighting to kind of tell you what mood to be in, even though that's not always necessary. I feel like they definitely do that a lot in this movie. Like you said, Nico, all the acting is great. Vera Farmiga is great. The little girl is great. I think the dad plays his part well. I think the other two kids do an awesome job. And one thing I want to give this movie credit for right off the bat is I think all these characters are fleshed out. A lot of movies we that we get to cover are just kind of, you know, there's a lot of stock characters. I don't think that, that this movie has any. I think there's a reason for me to either believe or invest in every single character they make important here. And I think that's not something that we get often on this show, at least in my opinion. So I, I give them a lot of credit. Um, as far as the twist goes, I know we're going to get into it. Um, I'm higher on it than both of you. I think it's awesome. I, I'll be honest. The first time I watched this movie, I did not see it coming. Uh, I saw something coming obviously, but I I didn't know what it was the very first time I saw it. And so for me, it kind of just took me back. It wasn't the twist I was expecting. I don't know when you go into a movie about uh, evil child, normally they've, they're possessed by a ghost or by the devil. Not this one. This is. This was something very, very different, and I, man, I enjoyed it. I think it's a really good movie. Is it scary? No, but I do think it's just a good movie, and that's that's why I'm excited to talk about it. Absolutely. Go ahead, Dustin. Yeah, so this film, uh, you know, here comes the part where Nico picks a film and I shit on it, right? That's been the pattern. Well, plot twist, ladies and gentlemen. I actually really like this movie. 
I thought that it uh, it's like Mike said, it's not scary, but it's very tense. And uh, if a movie can make me tense throughout, then it, it's it's got me uh, hooked, at least my attention. Um, I thought that the twist, I disagree a little bit. I could see the twist coming uh, somewhat. I, I just had this feeling like, hmm, and I don't want to give it away because we'll get into it. But uh, I could kind of see that twist being the twist, but it still didn't take anything away from it. But on the flip side, I still enjoyed the twist, so uh, I'm kind of in the middle of the three of you as far as the twist goes. I thought the acting was great, the production was great, the uh, just the the casting was perfect. And how could you not love a movie that one of the producers of the film is Leonardo DiCaprio? So shout out to Leo. <laughs> Well, one of my problems with the twist is that I knew it going in, so I yeah. never had that. So uh, that was one of the problems I had. Yeah, that's I mean, fair. I didn't, I didn't get that that surprise. So right, and yeah. once you I, do know, and once you know the twist, it makes it a little less rewatchable. Sorry, Dustin, go ahead. Yeah, no, you're good. And uh, I too, like you, Brian, I just watched this film for the first time this week. Uh, I watched it twice, and I enjoy it. Uh, I do have the small criticism that okay at two hours and three minutes does it yeah. need to be 123 <laughs> minutes probably not but they do a good enough job of keeping my attention and peter sarsgaard and uh vera formiga and isabel Farmer and even uh even i'm trying to find there she is ariana engineer little little max yeah she's great throughout. she's great and so great. uh yeah i just thought the casting and the acting was was spot on and and this this movie was one of the one of my favorite movies that Nico or Brian has picked. Hey, and before anyone else goes, <laughs> hey, why the hell did I? Why did I get thrown into this? Oh, oh I, I'm I'm sorry, I'm still just stuck on the descent. You made me watch that one. So, oh damn, one pick. Okay, and the and the descent is great, but that's not the point here. The main point I want to make before we start is. Vera Farmiga, call me sometime. Call me now. Call me yesterday. Call me last week. Call me three years ago. Call me now. Call me as as Norma Bates. Call me as this character anytime, Vera. I love you, even though you played a fraud in those two movies. I was waiting on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, and one more thing I wanted to say was uh, this week I did not know this, but this actually is based on <laughs> some true stories. Yeah, it's and, creepy. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah, creepy as hell, and I will – I'll. I'll briefly go over the true stories at, uh, after the film review, but uh, I honestly did not know that, and uh, I was like, holy fuck, this is real? Okay, uh, but let's jump into it, guys. <clears throat> I just want, real quick before we do that, I just want to say that was one of the more aggressive call me sometimes we've ever had, so he means that one, Vera. I agree. <laughs> I mean, I got to be honest. It's all, it's all love over this way. Mike, Mike's like the living Chappelle meme where he's slapping the water as George Bush, I think. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm just going to say I just realized Brian called our call Little Orphan Annie. All right, let's go. <laughs> All, right. All right, the film starts with Kate and John walking into the hospital. Kate's in labor now. It's their third child. Jessica is her name. Uh, Vera's, Vera. Kate, she's in pain, and she's bleeding in the wheelchair as she's being taken to the delivery room. Delivery room. And Brian, you're along with kids. I just said... She's on the bed now, and they tell her that the baby's dead. She screams in pain as they pull the baby out. <laughs> She's not dead, and they hand her this bloody, crying baby. It's disgusting looking. And now Kate wakes up. It was just a nightmare. She goes to the bathroom, and she, she looks at her scar. Kate's with her therapist now, tells her about the dreams, and maybe she's not ready for them to adopt. She passed the wine store and didn't stop. She's a recovering alcoholic from what happened. She picks, Mac, she picks Max up at the deaf school that she's in. Uh, she drifts off in traffic and almost gets hit by a semi at a red light. She's home and plays piano now, but she keeps getting distracted by Max playing basketball in the garage, which is a poorly placed basketball rim, in my opinion. She reads Max the story of her little sister going to heaven before bed. She asks if she's going to get a new sister, and that's a really touching scene because you can see Vera is really great at showing the emotion. Kate and John get into bed for the night. She says she has multiple feelings about adopting a child. She wants to give the love she has for Jessica to a child in need. They get to St. Mariana to look for a girl to adopt. Sister Abigail greets them. John hears a girl singing upstairs and goes to check it out. He meets her and is impressed with her paintings. Her name is Esther. John introduces Kate to Esther, and she's impressed with the paintings too. Esther tells them she's different and she wants to turn the bad things in life into something good. 
Sister Abigail says Esther is from Russia and her family back home died in a house fire. Flip my page real quick. Always wears ribbons on her neck and wrist. They all think there was a real connection. Three weeks later, the adoption is final. Esther is now their child. Esther is blown away by the house and shows Max she's been practicing her sign language. She meets her grandma and new brother, Daniel. He makes fun of her clothes. She gets excited when she sees the piano and loves her new bedroom. It's Christmas morning, and we see Daniel. He's playing Guitar Hero, and he's really jealous of the attention that they're giving Esther, not him. Daniel and his friends go up to his treehouse. He's got he's got a porno mag stash and a legit <laughs> setup in the room. Grandma asks Max it, how she's doing and why she's playing by the pond. And then, you know, they ask she the grandma asks her her plans about her career and all that. And I just wrote grandma's being real bitchy. All right, Dustin, go ahead, bro. That's the first two scenes I got. There's a lot that goes on. Yeah, so I'm you know, they do a good job of hitting the ground running as far as getting you a backstory without doing the typical here's the yeah. backstory thing. Uh, which yeah. I appreciate. They just jump into a scene and then you're just kind of caught up to speed right. without even really realizing what's happened. Then you're like, oh. And I agree that the scene where she's reading the the story to Max, man, that that'll kick you right in the right in the sack. That was a very touching scene. It's like, oh man, uh, who's cutting onions? And uh, you know, the then they go when they get to the orphanage and we get introduced to the first time to Esther. It's like, okay, I knew something was up. This little girl, like I went into watching this movie, I didn't read anything about it. I don't remember seeing previews about this film, so I literally went in cold to this film. The only thing I went to go off of was the the cover photo or the poster, which had Esther's picture, and I knew she was an orphan. That's it. So I knew she was going to turn out to be evil, sure, but I didn't know what kind of evil. And then just her acting in that scene, really, I, something was off. I was like, okay, she's very sweet, but something's just, this is weird. Uh, you know, she's a little too deep to be a nine-year-old little girl telling the stories with her paintings and shit like that. And then when they get, you know, they get, they get her back home, they adopt her. And when they pull up to the house, I, I was like, Holy shit. Is this the Cullen's house from twilight? Like that's a nice ass house in the woods. Okay. Um, then they get inside and it's Christmas. They're opening the presents and John pulled the most dad move of all time. He's paying attention to one kid and the other kid's like, Hey dad, look. And without even moving or barely even turning his head, he's like, Oh yeah, that's awesome, buddy. Like, I was like, yeah, that's a total dad move. I appreciate hey, that's it. Somebody, hey, that's somebody talking to me while I'm watching football. Like, yeah, okay, great. Sounds awesome. You know, whatever you <laughs> right. So, um, and then, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, Grandma, what a bitch. But I, I thought this opening scene did a great job of introducing us to all the key players in a hurry. The acting was spot on. The dialogue was great. The backstory was introduced in a way that it's going to, it's not distracting from what's going on now but it provides necessary context that we're going to need later in the film. So I thought this opening scene was really great. And, uh, you know, also the, uh, someone that we haven't shouted out yet in this film, shout out to CCH Pounder who plays sister Abigail. She's actually a really underrated actress in my book and she did a great job of sister Abigail. Uh, and so I thought this movie was just, I can't say it enough. This movie was very well cast and they didn't miss a beat. They didn't miss a single casting in this opening scene. You know, sadly, Dustin, that is not the first time Twilight has been referenced on this show. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> I, be- I believe my 30 Days of Night pick was was somehow compared to Twilight at some point. But anyway, I- I'll-, I'll try to get over that one day. <laughs> mm. um, anyway, okay, so um, this is what I meant by it kind of resonated too personally with me, some of this some of the movie um the opening scene i know is a dream but that's that's really hard for me to watch because i mean like personally we've actually gone through two very late term miscarriages so i'd be lying if i didn't like tear up a little bit watching that opening scene and it really made me want to throw up and so and so much of that first part of the movie is really like revolves around that and so maybe that's a lot of my problem with this maybe i don't know i mean that's that's stuff kind of still fresh to me so it's hard for me to separate it on a personal level um and kind of just look at it objectively but you know when i'm when i'm reviewing these movies i mean stuff scares me whenever it's on a personal level so i kind of feel like it wouldn't be fair to kind of block that out the way that affects me personal level Mm -hmm. so that if that makes sense so um also john isn't likable to me at all and you know i already like kate simply because of my preconceived notions of her just 
just because of past things Vera's been in. So, so it's John who has to earn my love. He has to take me on a date. Let me get to know you, John. And, and look, it's not his fault. He's not Patrick Wilson. Who is, <laughs> but, uh, but, but it is his fault or the writers that he just comes across like such a fuckhead. But, but again, Vera is so damn good. And especially in these scenes where, you know, they're establishing her issues, which are the backbone of this entire movie. So she has to be great. And she is, she brings it in this movie. Um, also, we already kind of touched on it, but Ariana engineer is great. Um, you know, she's mostly deaf in real life. So obviously she plays the character perfectly. Um, that bedtime scene that had no dialogue where it was just music and them kind of signing the story. That was a very powerful scene in my opinion, especially yes. what the story was about. Yep. Yes. Um, and uh, they apparently edited the piano scene down a lot. And Vera was furious with the director for editing it down <clears throat> as she's a skilled pianist in real life and uh, loved the scene. So um, that's my actual fun. First fun fact of the episode. Mike's a pretty uh, uh, and- skilled penis too. He'd like to show her. <laughs> He's a very skilled penis. <laughs> That's someone that plays the piano, a pianist. Yeah, Sorry. got you, buddy. I you I right. do play uh, uh, Stand By Me on the piano very well. Sorry, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I don't even know where to go after that. Um <laughs> Anyway, I'm not I'm not a few I'm not a fan of the few jump scares that they try to throw at you, like with John in the mirror um, and the kids like running by at the orphanage. Uh, it's like they were trying to remind you that you're watching a horror movie, and so I didn't really care for that. I felt like they were trying a little too hard. Um, and lastly, I mean, th- th- there's a lot in these scenes, and and honestly, there's a lot of really good character building, and I think that that's good and needed. And uh, but maybe there's not so much more that's needed in that regard because, you know, I, I know we kind of differ on this a little bit, but the, the runtime definitely presents a bit of a problem for me because I feel like that there's a lot of, a lot of filler. So, you know, there's a thin line as we talked about on character development and too much. So it's kind of, it just, it kind of depends on what line, you know, what side of the line you fall on there. Right. Um, and it's not that I don't think that the runtime is, isn't an issue. It just did it take away from my overall enjoyment, if that makes sense. I get, it's still a criticism that I have. Look, I'm not going to lie. Most movies that are over two hours, uh, you're asking a lot from me. You're asking a lot of investment. So that's just kind of a nitpick I'm always going to have. But um, all right, so right off the bat, this opening uh, dream scene, I, I think it's shot really well. And that's something that I noticed right away. The way they use the lighting, it's like a, it, it's very, you know you're in a dream, or at least you think you are. You know there's something different about it just by the way they shoot this scene. And like you said, Brian, that is a tough scene to watch. And I don't have the same personal experience, but it really is a tough, a tough scene. And, you know, and the part where she kind of gets the the baby body back is, is, you know, you're in a horror movie. Because there are, sometimes I forget this is in the genre of horror while I'm watching it. But then I remember a scene like that and a few scenes that come later where you're like, oh, yeah, okay, that's definitely that. And so I, I, I agree with all of you. I think that opening scene is really powerful. It's just so damn good. Um, oh, and, and I, one more thing. One more thing on that. Uh, I, I was. I thought you might mention it. I don't know if any of y'all mentioned it or noticed it or not. But to add to how creepy that is and how traumatic of experience that was for them to go through, if you pay attention, the delivery doctor is actually played by yeah. Peter Skarsgård in that scene. So he's playing himself. He's playing John. And he's the, the delivering doctor in that scene to add to the traumatic experience of, of that scene. So, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but... Oh, no, you're good, had man. To, had to get that in. Yeah, so, uh, like we already talked about, all the all the actors are great here. And like uh, Brian mentioned, John, not likable. And, and Kate is automatically likable. One, the experience she's been through. Two, we like Vera Farmiga as an actress, so I'm already, I'm already locked in on that. So... I I agree with Brian on that front. I know, shocker. But, um, so, Esther is, she's scary. Like, if if I went into this movie and I was of a certain age, and I, ju- I just went in completely blind and nobody told me anything about it, that character would scare me. And I know that, that I've kind of mentioned on this show before, kids and horror freak me out more than just about anything else. If it's done properly and it's done the right way, like Danny in the shot, like, like there's a lot of, of, of kids in horror that scare me more than adults. 
And this is one of them. I think it's just so well done. Hey, Mike. Uh, yeah. We actually have a fan question about that later, too, so don't go too deep yet. All right, I'll save my rest of my thoughts. But, um, no, I like all of this. I think there is some – I love the character development. And like I mentioned earlier, I love the way we flesh at least every character out. We give every character something. And I know sometimes that does become a little m- monotonous, but – I, I think it's really well done. Like I don't have any issue with the script or the writing and I know the runtime is long, but I think these scenes really help me invest later down the road. I want to care about these characters. Like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I don't care about any of these characters. So it's kind of hard for me to invest in the movie. This is the complete opposite of that. Even up to the Christmas, like, you know, the grandma being a bitch. Well, I know this is who the grandma is. <laughs> She's a bitch. There's obviously something there. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all I have. I think it's really well done. And I think the first time I ever saw it, I knew that we were, you know, the poster literally said something's wrong with Esther. So I knew that there was obviously going to be something, but the way (laughs) it's acted is just so well done. Like I can't say enough about the name is slipping me. And I know you guys have already said it, but I can't say enough about her performance job. Well done. And the scene uh, Brian mentioned it. The scene where where K- K- Kate and Max are going back and forth with the sign, their decision to kind of use that from Max's perspective, and you kind of get that like that that you know that no sound that I hate to say deaf sound because there's really right. that doesn't really work. But you guys know what I mean. The way they decide to use that, I think is so it's so good. It, it's very powerful. It's a great scene between the two. And a lot of good character development. And like I said, you like Kate, you like Max, you're rooting for them in this movie. And you know they're about to go on some long ass journey with a lot of crazy shit. So um I I think all, all of this is great all the way up until Christmas. All right. Kate and John, they start to get intimate in bed. And this is the first kind of real Lucky cool. bastard. <laughs> we uh we, we see some lightning flash. And we see Esther just hovering over Max. She's like standing over her bedside. It's really creepy. Uh, the two girls go sleep with the parents. <laughs> and, we, and you kind of get a funny dad scene where John has to hide his erection from everything. And and it's pretty funny. Uh, Esther comes down. The next morning, Esther comes downstairs and everyone laughs at her attire for school. Esther calls Kate out for wanting to be different. A girl in class makes fun of Esther's dress. And then Esther gives her the stare down and marks her basically for later. Um, back home, Kate Kate scolds Max and Esther for playing on the frozen pond. Daniel is playing target practice with his paintball gun, and then he shoots a bird. Uh, Esther grabs a rock and tells Daniel to put it out of his misery because it's in pain. But he's too scared. He starts crying and doesn't want to do it. So Esther, she kills it as, she, as he cries. He, she squishes it with the rock. It's in heaven now, Esther says. Kate tells her, now Esther, she's taking a shower. Kate says that you're not allowed to lock doors. She goes in Esther's room to put clothes up, and she finds this mysterious book in her drawer. It has a picture of some random man in it. She puts it back in and walks off, but then you get a quick visual of Esther poking her head out the out the door, and I, I, it implies that she saw what happened. Daniel knocks her books out of her hand at school. Then the girl from class calls her a Jesus freak. Uh <laughs> Her black book pages scatter all over. Then she screams crazily as the girl grabs Esther's neck ribbon. Back home, Kate's giving Esther piano lessons. She said she made a lot of mistakes and doesn't want to talk about school. Kate shows her her scrapbook of family pictures. She asks who's Jessica. She takes her out to the garden and she shows her, you know, the flowers dedicated to Jessica where she put her ashes. Esther says she would have been lucky to have her as a mommy. John and Kate talk about her day with Esther. Then he makes a move on her. They start to get intimate in the kitchen. He lays Kate face down on the counter, but Esther sees them, and they panic. Next day, Kate tells Esther they have to talk about last night. (laughs) And then Esther says, yeah, they fuck, and then Kate is shocked. Kate tells John what happened, and Kate wants to take her to the doctor, and John doesn't think it's that big of a deal. All right, go ahead, Dustin. That's all I got for those two scenes. All right, yeah. So the the lightning scene where the kids get scared and they got to come sleep with the parents. You know, once you've seen the movie, you realize how fucked up it is that she's like, "I want to sleep with daddy." Um, mm-hmm. And then, 
you know, Esther gets to school, and I at first I'm like, you know, this is Eastern European girl. She's wanting to wear this dress. She comes from orphanage. Kudos to her for not caring what people think. Obviously, you know, the first time you see the movie, let her let her be herself, whatever. But uh, my God, a little barber getting that stink eye, I would have asked my parents to transfer me out of that school immediately because that stink eye was fierce. Um, then you get the scene where, you know, he's shooting his paintball guns. He shoots the bird. He didn't think he would hurt it. I said it out loud, PETA probably hates this movie. Because not only did they show the bird getting shot with a paintball, which obviously I'm going to go out on a limb and say no real birds were injured in the making of this film or harmed in the making of this film. But then they show Esther smashing it with the rock. And it's a pretty, uh, pretty uh, intense visuals that they give you there. And so, uh, yeah, PETA, this this movie's probably on PETA's shit list. Um, then, you know, you get the scene where the tension continues to build between Kate and Esther. It's not like... You can tell that they dislike each other, but you could tell that they're just not vibing like they really should. Um, and then, you know, you, but that's kind of fixed for a moment when she shows her the flowers, the roses that were planted and, you know, gives her the story about how we put the ashes in here. And as long as this plant grows, then it's like the, you know, the baby's still alive. And so it's like, oh, my God, that's sad as fuck. Uh, I, I was not ready for that scene, to be honest with you. Uh, and then. You know, well, let's just get it. They didn't get intimate in the kitchen. They were straight up fucking in the kitchen. What kind of parents of three just straight up fuck in the kitchen like that? I don't no, know. Hold on a minute. No, hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, you got to do it when you can, man. <laughs> in the kitchen, in the wide open kitchen, in the wide open kitchen. No. With okay. our arms wide open. <laughs> no, it's not arms wide open. It was her other limbs that were wide open. And <laughs> let's just put it this way. If we're never I'm gonna make money off this show. <laughs> if I'm Danny and I'm walking downstairs and see my mom and dad fucking in the kitchen, I'm gonna be like, Esther, I'll help you kill him. Let's do it right now. I don't give a fuck. I'm out. So I'll become an orphan too. <laughs> um and then you get the funny scene where she's like, you know, when Adults are really in love, blah, blah, blah. And Esther's like, yeah, I know. They fuck. Like that, I almost spit my drink out when she said that. And then you get the scene <laughs> where Kate and John, which, by the way, John and Kate, I couldn't help but think of uh, where's the other five Let's kids see. because they're supposed to be plus <laughs> yeah. eight. Um, but, you know, they're they're talking about it. And she's like, yeah, she just, it's like she, it wasn't even weird for her to say it. She just felt so natural saying it. It's like, what if the, at her old family, they were like, pass the fucking potatoes. I thought that scene was great, especially when she, at the end, she's like, fine, I'll fucking spend some time with her. And John's like, all right, bitch. Like, that shit <laughs> cracked me up. That was probably my favorite line <laughs> of the entire movie. It was that back and forth right there because it was hilarious. Um, but I thought that this, these scenes were not anything crazy happened. I mean, other than the bird scene, because to me, that shows everything you really need to know. Because that shows that this little girl's a sociopath. She'll just kill an animal like that with no remorse. Um, and then Rob Zombie taught us that Halloween. <laughs> you got that right. And then uh, you know that not not a bad set of scenes, but not anything groundbreaking other than getting the backstory with the flowers, which comes into play later. So oh, does it ever? <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah, yeah, that was rough. Um, yeah, so they and they definitely don't do Daniel Cole's character Jimmy any favors. He's definitely not likable either here nor the rest of the movie really. But I kind of got a theory on why. But I've got a little bit more about that in the next set of scenes, so I'll save it for that. Um, but but that sex scene in the kitchen is perfect. Like especially when John is like, uh, just for a second, I've used that line, so it made me laugh. Um, <laughs> Jesus, the, <laughs> we're off. The uh, yeah, we're canceled. Um, <laughs> Uh, the bird scene, yeah, I feel the same way Dustin does. That shit surprised me. I did not expect that. I expected right. it to just like cut away there. Um, it, it, it and it showed the whole thing, and I was like, oh, okay, goddamn. But uh, I, it made I was like, whoa. Uh, so I'll kind of get into that a little bit later too. Um, and I don't really have a lot on these scenes. To me, it was just like some more character development, and it was fine. It was good, you know, to flush some characters out. But you know, some of this I kind of feel like actually could have been cut with the you know to kind of maybe trim that run down a little bit run time down a little bit yep yeah um i like this so i like these set of scenes for the reasons that i don't know i think that brian has a little bit of a problem with them and that's okay 
I think this is good character development. Um, I, okay. So first of all, this is really kind of diving into what Esther really is. And you start to kind of see it. I like, I like that. I like that. They're not giving too much away, but there, again, there's obviously something going on here with Esther. And I like the way they play that the scene where she takes her to see the flowers. It's actually a really sweet scene. And the first time you ever watch this movie, it's like, it, it's a really sweet moment and you don't exactly know what's going on. So you kind of locked into it. And like you said, they don't do Danny any favors. He's so damn unlikable in these scenes. He's a bully to her at school. Uh, and you almost kind of feel for Esther, but you don't, you know, you don't want to because you know, something's coming later where I don't want to feel for this character, or at least not yet. Um, and that's kind of why I like it because they're not tipping their hand too much about what, you know, what the real story is here. Um, And like you said, you get a lot of backstory. There's some good fleshing out of characters here. It, it's a, you know, the scene where they, (laughs) the scene. Okay. For one, Esther cock blocks in the bed and that's bullshit. I would have, man, take your ass back to your room. It's a damn thunderstorm. I don't want to hear this shit. And second of all, the one in the kitchen, I understand Dustin's point. He can die on that hill if he wants to. No, nah, man. No one was around. The kitchen was open. When the moment is right, it's right, son. And I'd have told Esther to, to take her ass back up there too, man. Take Danny. Take Max. Everybody, get the fuck out of the room. I got things to do. I'll be done in two and a half minutes. That's all yes. I got to say. CPS going to have you labeled a sex offender when your orphan daughter uh, says she saw you fucking mommy in the kitchen. Well, well luckily for her, <laughs> sh- never mind. The twist comes later. <laughs> What does Brian say? Let me tell you about the real world. <laughs> that was me. Let me tell you how the real world works. That was, yeah, that was Mike. That was she, she, really Mike. Let me tell you how the real world works, pal. All right. John is pushing. Is she, he's pushing Max on the swing now at the playground. A neighbor with a busty chest tells John she misses him on the HOA board. Esther hones in on the girl who bullied her at school. John appears flustered by the neighbor. She asks if he'll come move a chair for her. Now the girl, she's playing on the playground equipment, and she feels like she's being followed. When she finally gets to the slide, Esther appears and pushes her, and she falls and breaks her ankle on the slide. Now we're at dinner, and John asks her and Max what happened. She fell, I swear. Daniel asks why she eats weird and makes fun of her, you know, where she's from and all that. Let me flip my page. Daniel says his friends make fun of him because of her, and that they should send her back to the retard camp. John says to apologize to his sister. She's not my fucking sister, he says as he storms away. As punishment, John locks up Daniel's treehouse. Kate is at the store with the girls. Sister Abigail calls to check on Esther. She says she needs her medical and dental report, but Esther isn't thrilled about going. Kate tells her about the school scene. Kate hears Esther playing. (laughs) They're back at home now. This is funny. Kate hears Esther playing the fuck out of the piano. She questions Esther. Then Esther is rude and says it must be frustrating to love music and have a son who's not interested in a deaf daughter. She tells John she's been lying to her. John says she just wants to spend time with her. Kate says Esther is better around John than her. Now she questions about John's uh, moment with Joyce, the neighbor from the playground. They start to fight over their previous mistakes. John cheated 10 years ago. All right, Dustin, go ahead, brother. All right, yeah, so... First of all, when you get to the playground and you, you meet the slutty neighbor, it's like, oh, come on, John. Like, I can see it right there. Like, it wasn't really, it wasn't stated, explicitly stated that he was slutting it up with the neighbor, but it was implied. Right. And But then he did gain some points back in my in my book when she's like, can you come help me with move the chair? And he's like, yeah, Kate and I will come over and help you. Like, Okay, so that to me showed that he's he's trying to better himself, trying to make his marriage work. He doesn't want to just, yeah, I will come and give her the idea that's going to be like old time's sake. So kudos to him for that, I guess. Uh, Esther pushing Barbara off the slide was goddamn gangster. Like, that scene was awesome. Esther's cold fucking blooded. Jesus (laughs) Christ. Throughout the whole movie. You going you gonna to make fun of me on my first day of school? Well, you're going to break your ankle, bitch. Like, I love that. And the way that scene was shot was actually brilliant because the camera was so close to Esther or to Barbara's face as she's trying to navigate this playground and this uh, uh, swing set, jungle gym, whatever the hell you want to call it. 
that, uh, you know, it really did a good job of picking up her uneasiness and the tension, uh, tension of the scene to where when you felt like at any given point, you're going to get jump scared by Esther and Esther's probably going to kill her. And, you know, they did a good job of building that tension up to the point to where she gets to the slide. And then here she is. You gone. I, 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 lo- I love that scene, to be honest with you. I thought that was that was shot perfectly, executed perfectly. And the fact that, you know, Max saw it and they they did a good job of, first of all, John, he's going to walk off on the playground and light up a cig. You're going to smoke a dart right there on the playground with all these kids, all these undeveloped lungs just around. You're going to smoke a, anyway, um, <laughs> I had a problem with that, but. You definitely couldn't do that in COVID time. Oh, anyway, sorry. True. Uh, and then, you know, they you get to the grocery store and I thought that this was, they did a good job of showing how Esther was building this relationship with Max, but you know you can tell that it's not sincere. It's just to uh, manipulate Max and use Max for what she can uh, gain from it. And then I, I laughed out loud when she's you know, reading the lips, reading um, Kate's lips, and trying to tell Esther what she's saying. And then she pans back to her and she sign, she does sign language for a what's an f bomb. I thought that was hilarious. And then. You know, the scene where they get back home and she walks in on her playing the piano and she's playing the piano just like unbelievably well. And man, that was a cold hearted line she delivered there about it must be so hard, uh, you know, with one kid being deaf and one kid not liking music. It's like, shit, bitch, like, calm down, you little girl. Like, you're, you're grounded for the until next Christmas, you asshole. But, uh, I really like these scenes. It was the pinnacle of these scenes was the slide scene, though, because that was awesome. Yeah. First off, John and Kate, his parents are fucking awful. Let me just say, I would have probably beat the shit out of my kid if he talked like Daniel did at the table. Um, but let's be honest, that's probably why he's like that in the first place, because they're terrible parents. But OK, so this is what I was talking about earlier. I do have to wonder, though, knowing what happens to Daniel later. I wonder if the writers played with that thin line of, quote, you know, okay, do we make this kid as likable as Max? Because if so, the audience may turn on us given what happens later. Um, Because, I mean, in early drafts of the script, she actually does kill Daniel. And, like, you know, I know they kind of, you know, in this this cut of the script kind of make it where, all right, well, he may not have died. You know, we're not sure. Um or he may, he may survive, he may be okay, whatnot, but they actually did kill him in that. So maybe they, I think maybe that's why they made him such a dick kid, I think, you know, I don't know. Also, parenting 101.2, and I say point two because parenting 101 was checking under the kid's damn bed and saw. So this is 101.2, the kid is punished, but yet still able to play video games. That's rookie mistake right there, Sarsgaard. Um, and not to be confused with Skarsgård, which, by the way, did you know Sarsgaard, here's a little fun fact, is married to Maggie Gyllenhaal. Here's a little Batman connection for you there. Sarsgaard is in the new Batman movie coming out, and Gyllenhaal was in The Dark Knight. So there you go. <laughs> um, just about the only scene here with, with much like real meat on the bone to me is the argument scene. And kind of Dustin touched on this just a little bit, but I do like how you basically you get you get their 10 year history of their relationship. And, you know, bam, right there. Then they had an affair who it was with and she had some incident happen, but you don't quite know just yet what she did. So the writing there is good to me, giving you that, you know, without making it seem out of place or shoved down your throat. Um, but, but to me, honestly, in this little group, uh, a lot of, a lot of this little set of things to me felt like filler too. Yeah. So, um, I like the set of scenes and I've said it for every set of scenes. I guess it's just because I like this movie. Not everything in here is great, but like Dustin mentioned, the highlight of these scenes is the scene on the slide. That is just the, our real first glimpse into what Esther's actually capable of. Like, yeah. She's there's definitely something going on. There's definitely something up with her character, but this is really when you get a big glimpse into, Oh, Oh, Holy shit. She is out for basically blood. Like she wanted that little girl to die, not just break her ankle. Like if that girl died, that would have been cool. And again, when you view this for the first time, if you don't know that twist, then that's just like an evil little girl, like geez, man. And so I thought that scene was great. And like Dustin mentioned shot really well, just the way they use that camera there. I, I think it's awesome. Um, and man, another glimpse into just how cold 
Esther is, is the line in the piano scene. Uh, again, not like a big major scene or anything where a lot happens, but you're starting to kind of see the tide turn where you, uh, I don't feel so bad for Esther anymore. She's, she's a pretty bitch. Like she's a bitch. It's just, I know she's a little kid, but she's a bitch. So them, them things are not mutually exclusive. They can be true at the same time. So the kid, I'm, I, I've, I'm, I'm starting to flip and they do a good job of kind of creeping into that, or at least my opinion, Brian mentioned them being uh, bad parents. Yeah. Yeah. They're definitely bad parents, man. <laughs> they're, uh, the worst. And, and, you know, their previous mistakes, look, the fact that the, the fact that that's all out there and, and Esther's kind of the one turning them against each other. I really like this script, like that plot, that whole thing where, now we kind of know she's clearly there to make their life a living hell. We don't know why, but we know that there's definitely something going on there. Uh, I think it's really well done. I don't have a whole lot more on these scenes. I just think if look, if you're into this movie, then these scenes don't bother you. And if, and if you're a little on the eh side, then I can understand this part kind of dragging along because we do get a little too much of this, of this, you know, slowly building the Esther character where I think some of this could be trimmed, but it doesn't necessarily bother me, but I understand that criticism here as well. All right. The family, they're just hanging out at the house and sister Abigail shows up. She tells them trouble seems to find Esther at her old school. A boy was stabbed through his jaw and Esther was there. Her last home wasn't an accident. It didn't, it didn't, you know, catch on fire by accident. It was arson. Esther asks Max to help her because there's a lady to take her. John defends Esther's behavior. Esther gets a hammer and the keys to the treehouse. Then she opens a safe and gets a gun, and she and she points it at Max's head. Sister Abigail leaves, and Esther and Max, they hide by... It's not really a bridge, but it's one of those roads that just go to like a creek or whatever. They hide behind the bridge. She pushes Max in front of the car, and Sister Abigail swerves and wrecks her car. She, got, she jumps out and checks on Max. But then Esther appears and hits her in the head with a hammer. They drag her off the road, and the body rolls down a hill. As Abigail, as Sister Abigail goes to get up, Esther kills her with the hammer with repeated blows to the head. She and Max hide Abigail and then stash the hammer in the treehouse. She makes sure Max won't tell on her. Danny sees them two leave the treehouse. He hides as Esther quickly glances at him. And then that night, Daniel is in bed, and Esther holds a box cutter to his throat and ask what, what he saw. And then, and then this is fucked up. She said, I'll cut your hairless prick off before you even know what it's for. If you tell, uh, and then my guy, Daniel, he pisses on himself. Cause he's so great scared. lines, by the way. Oh great. yeah. It's, yep. it's, it's scary as hell. Yep. The parent, the parents talk to the doctor after, <laughs> after Esther's session, she thinks Kate and Esther need to bond more. She brings up Kate's drinking and incident with Max. Esther is in the stall. It's you know it's one of those famous scenes. Esther's in the bathroom stall. She's like punching it, kicking it, and yelling. And it's and Kate. If she's pissed that John didn't support her more in the session, Kate gets a call from Sister Judith and tells her that Abigail hasn't returned and she's worried. The police find her body that night. Kate asks the cops if there are any leads. Esther's paintings reveal the uh, the old orphanage and they're on fire and there's dead bodies when she's turning her black light on and off. Kate does some internet research on children with character problems. Kate questions why John gives everyone the benefit of the doubt besides her. Kate wants to know more about Esther's past. Kate calls the old orphanage, and they have no record of her being there. All right, go ahead, Dustin. Yeah, so the Sister Abigail scene was shocking. I mean, I I, I was almost traumatized because, you know, you, you, you know, at this point you're like this little nine-year-old girl. She's really off in the head like this is nothing this is scary shit to think about if you adopt a kid and they turn out to be this uh because you know not only did she do what she did to sister abigail but the scene where they're on the side of the road and she's telling max okay go out and wave your arms she doesn't give max a chance to move she pushes her out in the road in front of a moving vehicle like that to me was my least favorite scene in the whole damn movie because if something happened to Max right then, I'd turn it off and I wouldn't finish the damn movie. I'd have been so mad. But uh, and then you know when Esther went hammer time, she, that that shit was crazy. She beat the shit out of that lady. Um, and then 
you know, the scene where she scares Daniel, I thought was some really good acting on her part. Uh, the way she delivered those, the, that line was great, and the way she delivered it was great. And then Daniel was, you know, scared shitless or pissless, I guess I should say. And then these scenes <laughs> do a good job of, you know, continuing to build the tension between John and Kate. Uh, John wanting to be the naive father that just believes that this girl can't have anything wrong with her, like you're overreacting. And then Kate just dead set. And now I'm telling you, this girl's vibes are off. And I thought they did a really good job through these uh, scenes. To, you know, Kate's tenacity. I'm going to track it down. I'm going to call everyone. I'll call Russia. I don't even speak Russia. I'm, I'm going to find out what's up with this girl. Uh, and then the, the blacklight painting reveal to me was some of the dopest scenes of the movie because that's really a creative way to, to have that kind of reveal. And the way it was done was awesome. It was, uh, it was just a great visual. And again, this is just another, another set of scenes that do a great job of, okay, now we're getting into the shit. It's really getting serious. And it was pulled off in a, in a very, uh, very, uh, enticing way. Uh, yeah. So the little girl playing Russian roulette, the little Russian girl playing Russian roulette, I don't know. It kind of seemed a little too on the nose for me, so I gave the movie the old okay, okay stare whenever they were doing it. Um, this group of scenes is definitely where it goes, you know, from zero to one hundred real quick. Um, but first of all, though, nitpick central. There's no chance those two little girls are dragging that probably 180 pound lady off the road like that. No chance. Major nitpick for me there. Not happening. Um, more props though to Isabel Furman. She's you know she's just we've said it so many times. She's so damn good as Esther. Um, hell, one of the fun facts I found, according to an interview on uh, on FearNet, is that she actually studied the performances of Glenn Close in Dangerous Liaisons and Anthony Hopkins from Sounds of the Lambs to prepare for their role of Esther. So, I mean, she just she killed it with that performance for sure. Um, so, a pet peeve of mine in movies is stuff that, and it happens like in these scenes, but it happens throughout this, and that's people talking and having a very, you know, important conversation to, to figure out the plot point. And then the antagonist is seen hearing it all from around the wall. And that happens like so much in this normally in movies, it's like once, but it happens like five damn times in this where like Esther's just around the corner and heard everything you said, or, you know, here and here and here and here. It's just very, it's very convenient. So it's a little bit of a pet peeve to me that kind of like started rubbing me with this movie. Um, and you know, I'll just say this group of scenes does nothing any more to make me like the character of John any more than I already did. He's just a douche who does not deserve the amazingness of Vera. I mean, Kate in his life. Um, also, and I know it sounds like I'm just shitting on this group of scenes, but at this point <laughs> in the movie, I checked to see how much time was left. And I found myself being like, God, we got another hour. Like really I mean, seriously, we're only halfway through the movie at this point. And I'm not saying that I was bored, but it was starting to kind of drag a little bit for me enough that I did check. And this should really be like a high point where the action's starting to kick in. But, and so I don't feel like that I should be feeling that way. I shouldn't be checking how much time is left in the movie and then being disappointed. That was a whole hour left. Um, but unfortunately, I was at this point. So I'm just being honest. Yeah, I, man, I love this scene with Sister Abigail. It's truly like not scary, but I think it's done so well because, again, you feel bad for Sister Abigail. And I mean, I do have a couple nitpicks with it. You know, like you said, the girl's carrying her. Yeah, OK, sure. And the Russian roulette thing, I I kind of felt the same way. Like, haha, very funny, guys. But I do think it plays well to Esther's character. I think that that when Sister Abigail comes to the house, when when Esther opens the door, t to me that's a sign of okay, things are about to pick up a little bit, and they kind of do. Uh, well, obviously they do because the the killing of Sister Abigail is done really well. Like it's genuinely like the actress who plays her. I know Dustin mentioned her name. Does a great job selling the kill. Like I'm I'm a big fan of that scene. I think it's really well done. The, and this whole like. The snow is kind of, and I talked about it in 30 Days a Night, and we talked about it in The Shining. The snow in some of this is kind of its own character. The snow and the ice, the weather, the atmosphere is kind of its own. It adds a little bit to this movie, and I think it really enhances that scene. So I'm a fan of that. Uh, the box cutter, 
to Daniel Sorot, you know, like Dustin said, whew, we're really getting just how cold, and we already know, but we're really getting down deep to find out, oh, this isn't just like an evil little girl. Like, this person is nuts. Like, the box cutter getting this little prick off. Like, I think that scene is genuinely terrifying. If you, again, if you go into this not knowing the twist, like, I, I, I think that's a genuinely terrifying scene. Um, and the scene, I like the lighting and the way it's shot when she reveals her true drawings. I think that's really well done. Um, and I like that we have a mom, even though she hasn't been the best mom. I like that she cares enough now to, you know, I don't know if I would have, I mean, and this movie kind of has a bad spin on adoption, but they kind of had to rectify that because they received a lot of criticism. I was going to cover that later, but, yeah. but as far as this goes, like might not have brought her into my home anyway, but now that we have, now that she's here, at least she's willing to fight for her family because she obviously knows something's not right. There is just too much of this going on and, and it's, you know, she wants to get to the bottom of this. And so wanting to know, and kind of like the back and forth with her therapist, I think is it, it was kind of an interesting turn, but like you said, uh, Brian, I fuck John at this point, like have a little faith in your wife. If you're married, if you're, if you're married, you're supposed to kind of, you know, have some belief and faith in each other. And there's just like nothing there from him. It reminds right. me of paranormal activity. Like give your wife a break. Like believe exactly her. To, yeah. Like <laughs> believe her to an extent. And by the way, she's very far mega. I believe anything she tells me. So that's oh, all I got. Brother. <laughs> what would I do? Sky's orange. Yes, Vera. Sky's orange. Oh, brother. <laughs> what I do? All right. John goes to get Esther for a dentist appointment, but she doesn't want to go. So he lets her stay home from school and play hooky. Kate asks Daniel and Max how they get along with Esther, but neither of the kids tell the truth about it. Esther tells John she always wanted a daddy like him, and John tells her to do something nice for mommy. Esther, oh man, Esther. Esther gives Kate a bouquet of flowers, but it's flowers from Je Jessica's memorial spot. And then when, when Kate sees it, she's like, what did you do? And Esther starts to cry, and, and Kate like grabs her by the arm, and Esther runs off as Kate cries, and you know John blames himself. John says it was his fault. Esther puts her arm like in a is it a clamp or a vice or whatever, and it breaks her arm to make it seem like Kate done it. Uh, Esther is in bed and cries her daddy, and she shows him her arm. He takes her to the hospital, and back home he tucks her into their bed. He tells Kate she broke her arm. He has Kate sleep downstairs in the first time in history. The man kicks the woman out of bed. Kate goes to the, the wine store. <laughs> she, pour, she pours a glass for herself. She looks out at the pond and then pours it all out. The next day, she drops the kids off at school. Daniel drops his book as he's going inside. So Kate jumps out to hand him his books. But then Esther releases the emergency brake. And her in the car, it rolls downhill with Max still in it. And a man, he tries to stop the car, but he fails. And luckily, all the cars, you know, swerve and don't hit her. And nothing happens to Max. And the car just backs into a pile of snow. That night, the doctor calls out Kate. She tells her she wants, uh, Kate tells the doctor she wants Esther out of the house. John reveals the wine, and they have a place in rehab for her. Says she didn't drink it, but neither of them believe her. John says she's being manipulative, and she has a week to go to rehab, or he's leaving. Esther whispers to Max she'll shoot her if she tells. Daniel goes to Max and has her tell him what happened. She shows him the drawings of Sister Abigail and Brenda at school. She tells Daniel the hammer is in the treehouse. But, you know, like Brian mentioned, Esther was outside of the door and she overheard it all. Kate wakes up and sneaks into Max's room and Esther is in there. And Esther calls her out for almost letting Max drown in the pond because she was drunk. It, that's the secret about the pond. Uh, she reveals the diary, the family diary. She recites Kate's words on her baby Jessica's death being a real bitch to Kate. She walks out, and she calls She calls the sister and questions how they knew nothing. Daniel is heading to the treehouse to find the hammer. Kate goes in Esther's room and finds a black book. She finds several men's pictures in it and sees the word Sarn Institute in the back. Kate calls in to find out more about Esther. The person from Sarn says it's a mental hospital and not an orphanage. Daniel breaks in his treehouse and Esther, she's in there and she lights the place on fire and locks him inside. He climbs out of the window and she calls his sister. 
Kate calls his sister and tells her she's from Estonia. Daniel cries for his mom, and he falls on the ground, knocking himself out. Kate sees the fire and runs out. Esther grabs a rock to kill him, but Max pushes her down. At the hospital, Daniel has a neck injury, and they stop the stomach bleeding. Kate tells John about Esther's past, and she gets pissed John doesn't put the pieces together. Esther asks Grandma for soda money, but she uses, but she uses this opportunity to sneak into Daniel's room to finish him off by smothering him. Max gets worried, so she goes to check on Daniel. Max runs to her parents, and the intercom comes on because Daniel, he's not doing good. He's dying. He's in cardiac arrest. They bring him back, and then <laughs> Kate smacks the shit out of Esther. What did you do, you bitch? Then they give Kate a shot that puts her to sleep, and the next two scenes are the ending. Go ahead, Dustin. Yeah, so a lot to unpack here. Uh, the scene with the roses is you talk about it just a gut punch because, like I said earlier, the, those roses were coming to play. You got the touching story about how uh, you know the ashes were in that plant, and as long as the plant's growing, then it's like the kid's alive, and then Esther's like, well, I'll kill it for you. I'm like, holy shit. Did not like. Do not approve. Um, and then this psychotic little bitch puts her arm in a vice and breaks it herself i was like holy shit man like no take this kid back take just just take her back let her out on the side of the road like a like a puppy you don't want i don't like this um the scene with the wine i mean kate's not doing herself any favors here i get it that's a very traumatic experience and if you've had demons or addiction problems in the past yeah that's a pretty good trigger but if you're gonna pour a bottle down the sink then probably should pour them both and dispose of the bottles that is a little bit, you know, she's not doing herself any any favors here. Um, the the car scene, holy shit. Like, Daniel drops his book, so Esther's like, well, I'm just going to go ahead and try to get Max out of the picture here. Uh, that, that was a very uneasy scene, because like I said earlier, if anything happened to Max, I'm out. I don't, I don't, like, I don't want anything to happen to that precious same. little girl. I'm out. Same, same. And so, thankfully, that didn't happen. Um then okay, so when Daniel's in in Max's room and talking to her, letting her know, you know, what's in my treehouse, or we're gonna get it and show mom and dad, then they'll have to believe us. Blah blah blah. Daniel, you stupid fuck! You're talking to a deaf sibling. Maybe just use sign language so you reduce the risk of Esther standing on the outside of the room and hearing what you're saying. You dumbass! Like that, yes. I I was so irritated with that scene. Because all you had to do was sign. You, you don't have to speak it out loud. If you want to mouth what you're saying so she can read your lips as well, fine. But don't make audible noises with your mouth because, it's, anyway, whatever. I had um, that same thing. I'm glad you said it. I had that same thing. God. But I do like how every scene from here on out is just tense. Uh, it, it's, it's very well done. It's very uneasy. Everything is intense. The intensity is cranked way up. Um, you know, then you get the treehouse scene where she locks Daniel inside and sets that bitch on fire, like left eye from TLC. Here's the thing. <laughs> You're going to try to tell me that John's not going to believe Kate now. Like, yeah, the, the treehouse just happened to catch fire in the snow. Exactly. Like John, you, you're not doing your due diligence as a husband to look into what your wife's saying here at this point. I gave you the benefit about, if you notice through this whole review, I haven't questioned John's commitment to his wife uh other than the infidelity thing i'm talking about him believing her i haven't questioned his commitment to uh at least hearing her out uh, that's whatever but now you're telling me that my kid fell out of a treehouse that was on fire in the winter time and we don't have a reason why it set on fire and we found out earlier that you know one of the houses that she was living in it was arson hmm i might start putting two to two together here uh then you get to the uh, the hospital and that grandma, man, she's worthless. What a, what a terrible old hag. Because she was a yep. bit earlier in the movie. And then she had one responsibility. Keep little Esther's naughty ass where you can see her. And what you do, you give her a dollar to go smother Daniel. Um, I don't just, God, what a terrible grandparent. I get it. Grandparents sometimes can be naive and uh, they want to see the best in kids. But that's a badass kid. You should see, you, should, you know, I'll put some of the blame on hers. You got to see the pattern just like John has to see the pattern here. And, uh, the whole, whole scene could have been avoided. Had that grandparent just been like, no, sit your ass in that chair and don't move till your mom gets back. She'll go get you a Coke when she gets back. <laughs> hey, hey, Brian, I want to get, before you go, 
I know you agreed with Dustin about uh, Daniel, you know, talking to Max. The only pass I'm going to give him is I'm not sure if he knows the sign language that good. Just because, you know, when they were at dinner, he, was, he asked mom, you know, what's she saying? And then, you know, Esther chimes in. She's asking to pass the butter, and that's what caused the argument. So, I mean, I totally get, like, dude, why are you yelling so loud? But I, I honestly think he just didn't know the sign language that good. Okay. That's what they were trying to write out anyways. Okay. But, I get, sense, yeah. but I get where y'all are coming from, though. So you, so you got a five-year-old sibling. In five years, you haven't learned the, the sign language. Or in five years, you haven't learned that you can also write it down because I'm pretty sure that kid, well, she might not be able to read. So, okay, I'll give the pass on that. Hey, man. But if I, that's that's hey, a terrible man. sibling then. He's a kid. He ain't trying to learn that shit. <laughs> Fucking kids. He's kind of an asshole, too. He's kind of an asshole, too. He's a big asshole. A dollar, a dollar to go kill Daniel. That made my ass laugh, by say, the way. Come on, if you put man. it If that's, you put it that way. That's what she did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. <laughs> um. Yeah, so I'm sure you guys have it too, but in this group of scenes where Esther says that, you know, it must be hard to love and adopt a kid as much as your own. This is what Mike was talking about. I touched on a little bit earlier where he said, you know, that there's a lot of adoption agencies and just pissed off parents of adopted kids that wanted that line removed and, and actually petitioned to do so. Obviously, that didn't work out for him, but uh, since it's still in the movie. But uh, that was just kind of a little fact there that Mike had touched on a little bit. Um you know, and I'd, I'd almost gotten to the point in this movie, you know, that I'd kind of forgotten the whole miscarriage subplot. I mean, maybe not forgotten, but it definitely wasn't thrown back in my face. So I had shifted my focus. We'll go to that. But the whole flowers thing, man, that really got me. It really fucked me up good again. But I'm going to be honest with that. Um, and I get the purpose of this group of scenes. And, and you know, the car scene is definitely tense. But. You know, you know, and, and I get that it tears down Kate and it's trying to build the tension with you as you continue to wait for the, you know, everyone to find out what you as an audience already knows. And so I get that. But I just felt like it was it was a little bit too much and it went on about 20 minutes too long, probably. Um, you know, and of course, you like Nico mentioned, you know, we get yet another scene where Esther overhears something yet again. Um, but I will say. From the fire, from the point of the fire to the hospital, I really liked it a lot. Like at this point, but, but yeah, Dustin's right. Like at this point, they're making John out to not only be an asshole, but now he's just a fucking idiot because now he's not entertaining anything, you know, that's just, you know, common sense logic at all. So, um, also back to the hospital scene, it's great. It's really great tension and it was a really nice touch with her having, the whole heart monitor on her and her heart rate not even going up the whole time that she's killing him. So that's like, yes. that is even further, yep. like shows Absolutely. how much of a sociopath, you know, yep. she really is right Great there. So up. I thought that was a really nice touch. So right off the bat with these, <laughs> you don't, when you know the twist, it makes a little more sense. But when the first time you see this movie and it's like the interaction with, with Esther and John is this is one that's fucking weird. Like, and I know it, it's, it's clearly, and they, it's played this way on purpose, but it's clearly a little more than daddy daughter. Like they're like the, you know, the whole, I'll let you play hooky. If you come down and draw with me, like, I know he didn't mean it that way, but her facials and her, the way that she acts that scene is super weird and super creepy. And so they're definitely setting something up there and, you know, knowing what's on the way makes a lot more sense. Uh, I thought that was, that makes this movie even more creepy than it already is to me. Uh, that flower scene, that is some cold hearted shit, man. That is some fucked up ass stuff right there. You knew damn well what you were doing. And again, we already know the, the person that Esther is, but this is some, man, that's a deep cut that man. I know Cheryl Crow said the first cut is the deepest, but no, nah, man, the fourth cut is the fucking deepest. That was some deep shit. God damn, Esther, that is, that's dark, man. And then her breaking her arm, that's, man, I like that scene a lot because one, I think the lighting is really well and I like the right, the lighting is really well done. And I know I kind of use that a lot, but I think it was the way they shot that scene, the tension of it. I, I enjoyed it. Thought it was good. Um, some of the stuff with the intervention and, and therapists just kind of dragged for me. Like, yeah, we get it. She used to, you know, she, the, this is the reason why she drinks and all this stuff, but just another example of John being an asshole. 
like just not not believing in his wife, not having that courage of conviction. It, it, it really bothered me. Like I'm just not a big fan of John at all. And that scene really hit that home for me. And I know maybe I'm not supposed to be a big fan of John, but it just kind of, it just bugged me. It went a little long. Uh, and I will say this, this is the one time Esther over here in the conversation did bother me. Like we already saw this. And so she's around every little corner. Who the fuck is she? Jason Voorhees. Like she's literally everywhere. Like, nah, I'm not buying that. So, and then, you get Daniel in the hospital. First of all, the tension and the way that the treehouse fire is done, I love. I think it's so fucking good. Acted really well by both kids. Uh, and and Vera plays her part well. Like, everything in the hospital is so good, man. And the way that, you know, the grandma gives the dollar, you're like, you stupid fuck. Like, that's literally what I said the first time I saw it because I knew what was coming. And... I'm glad someone else noticed that there was no heart rate for Esther. Because I said that same thing upon this last watch. Like, oh, that's on purpose. That's a cool little fucking detail that that somebody put in there that I, I thought was really well done. So, um, yeah, man, I like all this. From the point of of the flowers on, I think that this is one hell of a roller coaster ride that we're about to go on. I think it's really good. So, uh, yeah, man, that's pretty much all I have. I think a really nice touch is when the treehouse is on fire, it's Max who saves uh, Daniel when Kate's not paying attention. Because, you yep. know, John saved Max when Kate was drunk, but now it's Max who saves uh, Daniel. I think that's a nice little touch as yep. well. All right, the next two scenes are the ending. And there's, you know, a lot going on here too. All right, Kate's in the hospital now. She's just asleep. They're letting her rest. John tells Kate that Daniel will be okay in a few days, and he's taking Max and Esther home. He tucks Max in bed, and Esther, you know, steals her her hearing aids as she tells her sweet dreams. John sits on the couch and he pours himself some wine. <laughs> and I wrote, "My man's is stressed." Esther puts on a black dress, uh, trying to swoon John, who's drunk now. She sits on the couch with him. She brings some like finger foods. He asks about her makeup. She kisses him over and over. And says, let me take care of you. And then he like freaks out. He tells her she's confused. He loves Kate like that, not her. He cries and tells her he's worried about Daniel. She calls him handsome and reaches, you know, for his junk. She says, <laughs> and then he like freaks out and says, I'm questioning how long you're going to stay in this house. And then she yells, stop treating me like a child. Kate is woken up by a call from the Sarn Institute. The doctor tells her to call her husband and the police. She's not a little girl. She's a grown woman. She has a rare hormone syndrome. Her name is Lena Klama, and she has scars on her, her wrist and her neck from a straitjacket. And in between this uh, scene with Esther and the doctor, it intercuts with Esther pulling out her fake teeth, and, and she's uh, she reveals her scars, and she's wiping that makeup off. Uh, Esther, and now she, you know, it's they say that she killed her last family when she couldn't seduce the husband. She destroys her room. John goes in the room and sees her real drawings. There's naked men and women kissing in the destruction at the old orphanage home. The phone rings, but the power goes out before he can answer it. Kate's driving really recklessly and almost crashes again. John sees the destroyed circuit breaker and looks through the house. And then Esther stabs him in the side, and he falls to the ground, and then she stabs him over and over, killing him. Max sees it all, and Esther chases after her. Kate's home and literally drives into the house. Esther gets the gun. Kate finds a dead John. She grabs a flashlight and she's wandering through the house. And then Esther shoots her, shoots at her, hitting her arm. She goes in her room and she sees what Esther did to set the mood for John and her. And I just wrote, there's a cat and mouse through the house with Esther, with uh, Max and Kate. Max is in the garden and she knocks a potted plant over, revealing where she's at. Kate is on top of the glass roof, guiding Max. Esther shoots at Kate and then shoots at Max. Kate breaks through the glass, falling on top of Esther, knocking her out. Kate and Max leave to the pond, but when the police arrive, Esther is gone now. Esther charges Kate with the knife and cuts her leg. They wrestle for a bit, and then Max shoots the gun, and she hits the ice, and it breaks. Kate and Esther fall into the cold water. Esther stabs her again and pulls her under, but then Kate elbows her and climbs out. But Esther grabs Kate's leg one last time, and Esther says, don't let me die, mommy. And then 
Kate says, I'm not your fucking mommy. And she yells it and she kicks her right in the face and it breaks her neck and she sinks to the bottom. And now we just see Kate walk off with Max and the police greet her. All right, that's the ending. Um, but obviously that scene with Esther and John was, was super uncomfortable, but uh, it was originally written to be longer and more sexually graphic, but much of that was cut, thankfully, to be quite honest. Um, but I, I think I think the ending was great. Um, I think it was smart writing uh, to have John drunk and a little more useless than he has been the whole movie, which is hard to do, by the way. But, uh, you know, it, it at least it explained with him drinking how he was unable to really defend himself against Esther. And I thought that was a really nice, nice little writing touch. Um, Vera's acting when she finds John is amazing, as it has been the whole movie. Um, and the tension as she is like looking around the house for Max is great. Um also props to the makeup department as well because Isabel was like, I think 12 or something when this movie came out. Um, they did a great job here, especially with her teeth of making her look like she really could be a lot older. Mm -hmm. um, it makes her look uh, fucking diabolical. Sorry, I've been watching the boys a lot on Amazon, by the way. Um, but I think the whole, the whole house scene uh, would be great, even if it was just Vera and Isabel, but or Vera, Vera and Esther, why not say Isabel? Um, but the whole Max being involved but not really able to hear aspect, I think, makes makes it even better. So I think I, props again. That was great. Um, by the way, I want to give even more props because I was being an asshole, and I counted the shots that came out of that gun. And uh, there were exactly six shots. So, you know, assuming she loaded it all the way. So I'm impressed. So good quality control there. I just wanted to put that out there. Um and lastly, you know, an alternate ending has Esther uh, not fighting Kate in the pond, but instead is like up in a room putting on makeup once again, assuming the role of Esther as she greets the police. So it doesn't say, but I assume it would once again be implying that she's trying to frame Kate here. And I almost wish the movie had the guts to kind of end with that and, and to do that, to be honest. Um, not that I don't like the ending now, because like I said, I really do like it. But shit, I, I, I don't know. I almost like that ending better. But uh, that's all I had. Okay, so I really like the ending of this film. The The last few scenes are good. Um, the I want to point out, though, how terrible this hospital is. First of all, they don't follow proper <laughs> protocol because uh, I actually watched this movie with a nurse last night. And when the orderly stabbed her in the arm with the, uh, the needle that put her out, drugged her or whatever... I said, damn, y'all carry stuff like that? She said, ah, absolutely not. That's a lawsuit. So, yeah, that doesn't happen. And then, so you're going to tell me that uh, they've got her in this room because she's a threat to a little girl. There's not going to be a cop or something waiting for her outside the room when she wakes up. She, she can just get up and walk out on her own accord. Uh, also, dumbass, why are you just rushing home? Why not call the cops first? That would be the first call I made right then. And then try to rush home. Also. I know I said I like these scenes, but I'm ripping it apart right now. I swear it gets better. Um, you know, she's been in the hospital drugged and unconscious, and then she's perfectly fine to go 90 in a snowstorm, apparently, and not wreck. So, uh, okay, sure. I, I can I can buy into that, I guess. Um, but, yeah, great job with uh, Esther's makeup, like Brian said, and the, uh, the effects there to make her look like, okay, I, maybe she is old enough. And... Also, like Brian said, I am glad they cut out the extended version of that scene because despite the fact that they're selling it on, she's a 33-year-old woman. She's actually 12 at the time this movie was released. So storyline-wise, yeah, sure. But in actuality, that's a little girl playing that part. I did not need to see any more than what we saw. Even what we saw made me really fucking uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, well, it, it, was, it, it did a good job of, con you know, Selling the fact that that's why she is the way she is. She tries to get in, and it all makes sense now. It makes that line at the first of the movie even more fucked up when she's like, I want to sleep next to daddy. Um, so, yeah. Great job there. The you know She, she had stolen Max's uh, hearing aids, and so I agree. It, makes it, it adds to the fact that Max can't hear a damn thing in these final scenes. Um, I really hate how John went out. I'm, I'm you know... I don't know. I'm pretty sure that if I had drank one bottle of wine, because that's all he had was that one bottle that she didn't pour down the sink, I'd be able to you know, stave off a nine-year-old girl. 
Sorry, John. Maybe you're just a pussy, pal. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, maybe maybe they try. Maybe they try. I gave them too much credit. Maybe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, you know, maybe that was his first time drinking. I remember my first time, my first beer. But um, <laughs> the ending scene, I thought that. You know, it all comes full circle, right? Earlier in the film, she's freaking out so much because of the ice and don't be on the ice and all the traumatic things that almost happened on the ice. And then she falls through. And I, I love the delivery of, I'm not your mommy, bitch. Or I'm not your fucking mommy, whatever she said. She kicks her in the face. And that's how Esther meets her demise. I like how that was shot. I like how that was that. Um, but also, I'm going to have to question Kate's parenting here. You just got out of sub-freezing temperature waters. You're soaking wet, and you go and hug your five-year-old daughter. Um, you probably just gave her pneumonia, so congratulations. You got two kids in the hospital <laughs> now, dumbass. Um, oh, but, <laughs> but overall, yeah, man, really fun ending. I, I liked it. Uh, <laughs> and just a, a nice, nice bow to tie on this movie that when I look at two hours and three minutes and I think back on it, I, it didn't really feel like two hours and three minutes to me. I enjoy this movie a lot and the ending was a fitting conclusion. Yeah. So I don't really have a whole lot more than what you guys already said. What I will say is I think this twist is executed really well. Uh, I'm a, I think I'm a little higher on it than the rest of you. I, I did not again, did not see it coming. I don't know what I saw coming, but it wasn't that. And I think they pulled off really well. And I am glad they cut some of that stuff out because that would have been really, really uncomfortable. And yes. I, I, I'm okay without all that. Um, but I think the way that John plays the actor who played uh, the Sars guard, I think that's a really, I think he acts that scene really well. Him kind of discovering that his wife is right. And, you know, drinking the wine and all that stuff. Like, I, I think that's really well done. Uh, and I think, despite all the stuff that Dustin pointed out, I, I think from the minute she gets out of the bed, Vera's acting is so good throughout the rest of the movie. And I'm, I'm not saying that you disagreed with that, but yeah, there's some illogical stuff there, but I'm willing to forgive it because she's going to save her kids, you know, a moment of solid parenting for once. Um, yeah. So I, I love, I love that the fact that this movie ends on the ice, like you know, like you guys said, it's coming full circle in the line. I'm not your fucking mommy. I think that's really, it, it's so powerful. Uh, and, I, you know, step of the cap to Esther though, man, she went down swinging. Cause if, if you spent all this time with her, even though now you found out she's a grown ass woman, but this whole time she's kind of been your quote unquote daughter. She kind of tried to tug at the heartstring one last time. I'll give her a little tip of the cap there. That's some sadistic ass shit right there. So <laughs> tip of the cap to Esther on her way out the door. Um, but yeah, I like all this. I think it's really uh, it, it's really good. I think some of the back and forth is a little long between Esther and Kate, but nothing to really nitpick about it. Just thought that we could have maybe shortened some of it up, but I think it's really well done. And by the way, something that I didn't really – Maybe I just didn't take notice because I'm so engrossed in the whole story. But the fact that Kate can't or not Kate, that Max can't hear that whole time really does add something. Like, mm -hmm. I think that, that, that that's a that's a little detail or a minor detail that I think is uh, makes a really big difference. Um, and I was going to wait until a little bit later to, to, to mention this, but I'm almost I'm almost a little sad that Esther dies because not that I didn't want her to die. I actually, and I know Brian's going to be like, fuck that. But I do think there is a little meat on the bone. Not for a sequel, obviously. That would be stupid. But hell, a prequel. I know I shit on prequels last week, but I think there's some meat on the bone with that Esther character. They're, That's a they're, scary. They're making, a, they're making a prequel, bro. Oh, let's fucking go then. Never mind. I did not know that. Okay. <laughs> I, I stand here corrected. Well, fuck you, Brian. I'm right. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know how I got brought into this. I'm kidding. I love you. I didn't even bring it up. I don't know what just happened. I Mike, don't either. Mike and Brian are fighting for the first time in 2020. Wow. That's not true. We agreed most of this review, except that I like this movie more than him. That's it. I don't even know what I said. I I just didn't. I wanted the. I wanted it to end like with her 
surviving and and that's true. You know, kind of hinting that would have been but, ballsy, buddy. <laughs> but I don't I don't know what you're talking about with the prequel and fuck me, fuck me. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Hey, it, it, it's because he didn't like the movie as much. Maybe he didn't want a prequel. Nope, we're getting one, pal. Oh, so okay. <laughs> oh, okay. That was that's fair. Hey, do you got any final <laughs> thoughts before I jump into the? Uh, I'm just going to touch on the the true stories behind Orphan. No, nope, sounds good. All right, and like I said at the beginning of this episode, I actually didn't know this was based on some true stories. Uh, one of the true stories this was based on was uh, a woman named Barbara Skrilava, I guess. Uh, when thir- she posed as a 13-year-old Adam, an adopted boy in Norway who went missing, but it was discovered that he was actually a 33-year-old Czech woman. Uh, she committed her first crimes in the Czech Republic where she came to live with two sisters, Clara and Katarina. I'm not going to try and pronounce the last name. And Clara's two children. Clara had significant mental illness, so much that it was the cause of her separation from her children's father. Because of this, Skrilava was able to easily manipulate her. And I'm not going to get real deep into it, but she did some real fucked up stuff. She had uh, she convinced the she convinced the sisters to even lock the boys in the basement and deprive them of food. That's how manipulative she was. So that's terrifying. And then yeah. there was a there was another story: an Indiana couple, Christine and Michael Barnett. Yep. They adopted in 2010 six year old Natalia Grace from the Ukraine. She had a form of dwarfism that made it difficult for her to walk. But, you know, they just didn't believe it, and they, they even changed her. They even caught her, like, pouring bleach in Christine's morning coffee, and they changed, like, her age on her birth certificate. But I'm not going to get real deep into it. I've got the article. It's from ScreenRant.com. If anybody wants to check that out, I can link you to it. Or, you know, just Google the true stories behind Orphan. It's really terrifying when you think about it. And one thing I want to touch on, I know, I, I know Mike brought it up, that and Brian, that you know, a, a lot of adoption agencies got real offended at this. It's like this is a movie. Like, why are you really getting offended? I mean, I, I just don't get the whole getting offended that easily. I mean, there's, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of successful adoption stories, and this is just a movie. I don't understand why you got so offended, but right. Uh, let's jump into our fan question, unless y'all have any uh, comments on the based on a true story stuff. No. Let's do it. Okay. Good. Uh, big time fan of the show, Michelle Merza. She asked on Facebook, uh, Mike, I'm going to let you go first on this. All right, brother. Do you guys find kid villains to be more scary than adult ones? Uh, absolutely. Kind of already said it. Uh, I, for whatever reason, it, it, if it's done correctly, if it's done hokey and cheesy, I'm not a big fan. But if it's done really well, like The Omen and uh, movies like that, I. I think it's a much more terrifying thing because it's not normal and it takes you out of that realm of, well, this could be possible, man. A kid being evil is something that's much more scary to me than just, you know, about anything else. So, yes. Well, I, I think mine, mine's a no, but it's, it's kind of the opposite. Like if the kids are the victims, it fucks with me a lot more. That's like, also like, true. Yeah. Like paranormal activity too. really meant yes. like I, I gave up after that French on that franchise after it. I don't even know why I went back for seconds. Um, but you know, after that movie, I was like, fuck this franchise, man, I can't watch this anymore. Like it really messed with me. So I would say no to the question, but the kids affect me more as victims than, than, uh, than adults. I think it's all circumstantial. Um, you know, a, a well-written movie and a well-executed uh, plot and casting can go a long way. You can make anything terrifying. I mean, look at Chucky as an inanimate object, really, or Annabelle, whatever, what have you. Oculus yeah. was a mirror. So it, it doesn't really matter child adult to me necessarily. I don't get freaked out one way or the other. I think it, it's all circumstantial. depends on the script and, and the movie itself. But I do want to say, Brian, that hold on to your butt because – I'm picking Paranormal Activity three, pal. You're gonna watch it. <laughs> well, well, it, I mean, I my, hey, it's 2020. Might as well fucking 2020. Go for it. Uh, I'll answer the question real quick too. I'm kind of with all of y'all on this. It just it, it's circumstantial. Like Gage in Pet Cemetery, he's terrifying. Uh, and yeah, I agree with Brian as well. Whenever kids are the victims, yeah, it's definitely scary. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm with Dustin. It's just circumstantial if it's done right. All right, let's jump into fun facts. Does anybody want to go first? I've only got a couple. I only got one. 
Go ahead, Dustin. You go first. Yeah, so Ariana Engineer, the little girl that played Max in this film, she actually is mostly deaf. And so uh, her acting was actually very authentic. And so that's just a little fun fact there. That was not a person with perfect hearing that was playing a deaf person. She actually is mostly deaf. All right, I'll go real quick. I only have a couple. Uh, I had that same one too, Dustin. That's that's really awesome of her. I, all the all the acting in this movie is great, and the kids were great too. Um, Isabel Furman uh, auditioned for the part of Esther while we- while wearing an old fashioned dress and ribbons around her wrist and neck. Uh, in the screenplay, Esther was described as having fair skin, delicate features, and platinum blonde hair. Although Isabel Furman did not fit this description, the filmmakers were so impressed with her auditions that they cast her anyway. And the subtle uneasiness of the film's poster is due to the image of Esther's face. It is perfectly symmetrical. Half of her face has been mirrored to form a whole face. Notice the identical twist of hair on each side. I got all those from IMDb. All right, go ahead, Mike. Money, Mike. Uh, uh, hey, 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 relax. I do this for you, so you know what... The... Anyway, um, so this movie had a $20 million budget, which, by the way, I think they used this budget properly. Like, this is a really high production value movie to me i yes. think that, that that that's not one thing i can knock about this film i i think it's really well made uh 78 million dollars worldwide so not not great but not you know not bad uh but i you know this movie has kind of a cult following as far as horror fans go and just fans of this movie in general like it's de- it definitely picked up steam on on uh blu-ray and dvd and and then streaming after that it was on netflix for a while as well so uh, again, a lot of a lot of fans of this movie after it hit theaters. All righty, let's jump into our favorite part of the episode: uh, favorite kill, least favorite kill, and the rating. And uh, it's brought to you by Manscaped. Go to manscaped.com. Use the code "Don't Go" for twenty percent off and free shipping. Uh, Brother Dustin, hey, hey, let's do this. You I'm know, excited for this finally. All right, here we go. I, I was I've been a bit harsh on your movie picks, Nico, uh, and uh, you know <laughs> at least one of yours, Brian. So it's time for me to redeem myself. I really, like I said, I really enjoyed this film. Uh, my least favorite kill is, is going to be John's because, like I said, I'm sorry. One bottle of wine gets yeah. you alcohol tolerance off, up, you little high school girl. Uh, second of all, <laughs> my favorite kill was Sister Abigail's just because of the brutality of it and the unexpected brutality i think is the key because has she just killed her uh you know stab her with the claw into the hammer in the throat would have been less shocking instead she bashed her face in repeatedly and was such a cold-hearted bitch about it like that was a really well done kill all right so i can't go crazy on this movie because i do think it has its flaws but i'm gonna give this movie a seven and a quarter which is the highest rating I think I've given one of Nico's movies in months. So did I redeem myself, Nico? Is that okay? Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Almighty. Oh, I'm, scared. I'm scared to see what Nico has this rated. <laughs> well, you probably saw a lot of love, so I'm not too mad. That's true. <laughs> All right, so, okay, I'll go. Um so my <laughs> this is fucked up. All right, so my favorite kill, the bird. I know I probably cried wolf last time uh, with the whole cow joke in the in the, you know Texas Chainsaw the beginning, but I'm not kidding this time. I think I think I liked how surprisingly graphic it was, and I expected like the cutaway, and it didn't give me that. So you know what? Fuck you. I'm picking the bird here for favorite kill. Um, <laughs> least favorite kill. It has nothing to really do with the kill, to be honest. But the lady from The Shield, Sister Abigail, I'm going to give my least favorite kill to. I respected the hammer. I respected the kill part. But it was the drag in the body that I was like, get the fuck out. So I had to pick basically between that one and John's death. And neither of them really had anything to do with the kill. I mean, you picked the John's death because of the being a pussy with the wine. I picked this one because of the drag in the body thing. So uh, that's that. those are mine there. Um all right, so the rating is hard for me. I mean, and I kind of touched on this at the beginning. Am I rating this on how good of a movie I think it is, or am I rating this on how much I actually enjoy watching it? Because if I'm rating it on how good of a movie it is, I think the acting's great. I think the writing's good. I do think it drags a little. So based on that, I would give it a seven or a seven and a half. But I've been rating these on my enjoyment factor. So I'm not going to stop doing that. 
Um, so I'm going to rate this a 5.75 uh, with that. Um, it's not, it's, it's just not a movie I want to ever sit down and just watch again. And, and that, so th- that's kind of where my, my rankings are coming from at least. And, and, and I don't think it's the movie's fault. I mean, besides it being too long, that is the movie's fucking fault, but I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like I said, this was a really weird one for me to, to rate. So, you know, 5.75, I guess that's what I'm going with. All right. So I'll go and then let Nico go with his pick. Um, my favorite kill is Sister Abigail, which is Brian's least favorite. I just think the kill is really good. I'll, I'll ignore them dragging the body off for, for the sake of this. Uh, I think it's well shot. I love that kill. It's really good. Uh, John's kill is my least favorite for, for the same reason uh, that Dustin said. Like, really? That's it? That's that's how you die, huh? After all this incompetence that you showed, you showed more incompetence. Okay. Uh, so, again, I, I kind of... Went away from a couple weeks ago where I completely shit on a film. I gave this film its flowers tonight. And again, it does have its flaws. It is a little long. There's there's some significant, you know, not necessarily plot holes is not the right thing I'm looking for. But there's some flaws about this movie that kind of kind of bother me a little bit. But it doesn't it, it doesn't take away from my overall enjoyment of the movie. Like, I think it's a really good movie, not just horror. Like, I think it's a good drama. Good, it, the, the, there's good suspense and, and you know, half thriller and all that stuff. And the twist, I love this twist, you know, more than my fellow co-hosts. So, so for that reason, I'm going to give this movie 7.5. I think it's really good. It's not great. Uh, the rewatchability factor is a little low because of the runtime, but I can pop it in and enjoy it and not have a problem with it. So 7.5. All right. Uh, my favorite kill, I'm, I'm alone on this one. I picked John, and I just wrote he should have believed Kate sooner. <laughs> and I, and I like I liked his kill honestly. Esther killed the fuck out of him. Uh, the least favorite kill I picked Esther. Uh, like all I, I wrote, li- I like all the kills in this movie honestly, but this one was probably just my least favorite. Uh, the rating I gave I didn't go super duper high, but I gave it an eight point seven five. Uh, film is very entertaining, fascinating, and creepy as hell because it's based on true events. How horrifying to adopt a child, do you think? But it's really an adult posing as one. Uh, the acting is phenomenal, top to bottom. Isabel and Vera were just amazing. And we can't forget the two kid actors as well. Uh, movies with some realism always scare me or creep me out more than the average slasher. You know, I picked The Strangers. I was really creeped out by that. Uh, there's a few cons. Uh, the trope. I watched a YouTube video, and he made a really good point. You know, the trope of one person, the one person detecting the evil while no one else does, that was really strong in this movie, uh, mm-hmm. which I, I was a good point that he made that I didn't really think about until he brought it up. Uh, regardless of all that, I really like this movie. It's a cult classic to me, and I look forward to the upcoming prequel. I don't know how good I like the, or how much I like the prequel because the director of The Boy 2 is doing it, and there's no way that Isabel Furman can do it because she's 10 years older now. So I don't know how, I don't know how, I don't know how excited I am for it, but I'll watch it. Uh, but yeah, 8.75 for me. Okay. So that puts our composite score this week at 7.3125. Nice. Uh, really enjoyed breaking this movie down. I'm glad that y'all uh, all seem to enjoy it as well, too. Uh, I totally get everyone's nitpicks, honestly. This is just a movie I really like. You know, I was kind of on the fence about the runtime, but this to me is just, if I'm in the mood to watch it, I'm in the mood to watch it, and the runtime doesn't bother me because I'm intrigued the whole time. Uh, We're here <laughs> to chew, chew gum and kick ass, let me just say. I'm all out of bubble gum. All out of bubble gum, baby. <sighs> uh, while I'm talking, though, I got yelled at this whole entire podcast for no reason. I'm just sitting over here, minding my own business, and Mike yells at me. So, Man, uh, Brian, just man. one time. God emotional damn. right now. <laughs> Okay, goddamn. Brian's getting uh, emotional right now. Sounds honey like moon's me. over. Sounds like honey me. moon's over. <laughs> uh, I got bullied today on Twitter for not ever watching any movies, and uh, for no surprise, <laughs> I have not seen They Live. So I was watching. Bullied for oh, never mind. I know I bull. I bullied him too, so I am an asshole. I deserved it. <laughs> hey, uh, really enjoyed the episode tonight. Uh, we hope you checked out our interview with Heather Langenkamp while still still got the uh, goose pimples thinking about getting Miss Heather Langenkamp on the show. That was awesome. 
Uh, Y'all have a good night. We really appreciate the support. Just want to remind everybody. Uh